Kristen Acheson here, and we're still talking about Chapter 4, Object Recognition and Top-Down Processing um, for Recognizing Visual Objects. So this is our fourth lecture. So in terms of object recognition, the visual system has to be able to recognize an object being the same, despite how we look at it. Um, so you need to be able to recognize your car, no matter where your car is. You need to be able to recognize a fork, no matter where you see a fork and what orientation a fork is in. Um, and this is called invariance. And there's two different approaches um, that we talk about in terms of how the brain does this. How does the brain react the same and recognize the object as the same regardless of how we see it, regardless of the issues um, that we talked about at the beginning of the chapter. So one of which is the signal, single representation um, view. And this is the idea that this is activated um, whenever an object is seen. And this is activated regardless of how it is seen. So not only every time it's seen, but regardless of the view. Um, that there's a single representation for each object. Um, so that chairs would then, regardless of the angle that you're looking at a chair, you're going to have the same reaction, whether um, you're looking at the chair from underneath or the side or a top, um, no matter what. But that reaction is going to be different than, say, what you would look at um, from a table. So all, all of objects that are the same type are represented the same way. So even um, the difference between an overstuffed armchair um, and a, you know, formal wooden dining room chair um, are going to have the same representation. The other way that we talk about this is that objects are represented in a view-specific manner. Um, and this is that there is as many different representations as there is ways of seeing an object. Um, so you have a representation of the side view of a chair, and you have a representation of the top view of the chair, and you have a representation of the bottom side of the chair. Um, so again, these are just the two different ways, um, the two different approaches that have been proposed on how the visual system does this. Um, so again, we have the idea that a chair is a chair is a chair is a chair is a chair, is a chair. I mean, that representation is going to be the same. And that's that single representation um, view. And then we have the idea of <clears throat> this view specific manner and that the view really does matter and that we're going to have a different representation for every angle that we can look at that chair. So let's talk about the different ways that the, what we do know about the different ways that the visual system represents these objects in terms of the brain. Um, there's a launch pad exercise that you'll go through on this as well um, that will walk you through these distinctions. So one of the ones we're going to talk about is modular coding. And modular coding, remember a module in the brain is an area or region of the brain that's specialized for some sort of activity. Um, in terms of module coding for object recognition, it's been found that there's areas of the brain that are, are modules of the brain, regions of the brain, that are specialized for specific objects. Um, we've found, um, such as the fusiform face area, the FFA, um, is a specialized region in um, the brain. Um, that is for recognizing faces. Um, and there's other areas in the brain that are specific for recognizing different kinds of objects, and we'll talk about those. The other idea is of distributed coding. Um, so this is, again, kind of the same option with singular uh, view or view specific kind of the, the two-sided modular coding view is going to say it's all happening in one area. Um, where dis distributed coding is going to say that it's going to be a pattern of recognition across many regions of the brain. Um, so that it's not just one area in the brain that's doing this, that it's across many areas of the brain, but there is a specific pattern um, to that activation that will be specific to what you're viewing. So different, different objects are still being represented different ways, um, but it's going to be spread out in the brain. So it's distributed versus being centralized into one modular in the modular coding view. So again, there is a launchpad exercise about this um, where it walks you through the different areas that this is happening in, area V1, which is our 
Again, our primary visual cortex, V2, which as you would guess with the two, our secondary visual cortex, and V4. And these get really more complex as the information goes in. So at V1, we have very simplistic shapes. At V2, they're getting more and more um, complex. By V4, they're more complex. And by the time we really get into these modules, such as faces in the fusiform face area down here, this little purple area, um, the parahippocampal place area, which is this green area here, or the um, extra striate body area, um, which is this dark purple area on the back there. Um, these are all different areas of the brain that have been found to really have that modular coating. Um, and what's nice about this Launchpad ex exercise is it walks you through the support for both of those, um, both the modular view and the distributed view um, of coding in the brain. So make sure you do that. Um, it, it really will help you kind of understand this information. Um, so this face selective area um, in the brain, um, in the, um, the IT cortex. So there was an fMRI experiment, and what it did was it measured 30-second sequences of different kinds of images. Um, and it looked at faces versus other objects such as um, just regular objects, houses, or scrambled faces. And again, this is really some of that research that's supporting this idea of the modular coding. Um, so again, they did an fMRI, um, so remember that's a functional MRI, so we're getting the really good images of the brain. Um, and they did these contrasts between seeing faces or objects. And you can see what's nice here is you can see both the what they saw, the activation of the pictures, and kind of how it went back and forth 30 seconds. So if you look at the far right graphs, um, it says F blank, Z, O blank, F blank, O blank. Um, so that's what they were seeing, okay? So if they were in the dark ones they were seeing faces um, and if they were in the light gray ones they were seeing objects in the top one the second one they're seeing dark gray is faces light gray is houses um, the third one down they're seeing um, intact faces for eye that's still that dark gray and scrambled faces um, for um, s um, that lighter gray um, and so again what you're seeing in all of those um, is that they're getting more activation for those faces, those intact faces in this area. So again, they looked at faces versus objects, faces versus houses, or intact faces versus scrambled faces. And what they found was that in this fusiform gy gyrus in the IT cortex, there was greater activation when viewing faces. Um, this is that region that's been termed the fusiform face area, or FFA, um, because it reacts differently to faces than it does to everything else including when it has all the same features of a face, that they're just presented in a non-face-like pattern in terms of the scrambled face. Um, so again, this is really going to support this modular view. Um, that There is a specific area of the brain that this kind of um, functioning and this kind of processing and this kind of coding is going on. What's nice is that they've also found um, support for this um, with monkeys um, in terms of both fMRI and also single cell recordings um, to really show that these FFA neurons are really, really highly selective for faces. There are some estimates that it's up to 97% accurate for faces um, in terms of what it's, what it's being activated by. There's also additional evidence of um, these kinds of modularity of face of coding um, in terms of different kinds of agnosias. Okay, and so this is this, again, this idea that a specific area of the brain is getting damaged. What is the deficit from that? Um, and so certain areas of the brain are damaged and that we lose different kinds of ability to, ver to visually um, recognize those objects. And so a visual agnosia is a brain damage um, where you're no longer able to recognize some sort of thing. You can recognize it through touching, um, but you're not going to be able to visually recognize it anymore. Um, and there's different kinds of this, um, one of which is visual form agnosia, um, and this is really about shapes, um, and this is something that's happening relatively early in that ventral pathway. Remember we said that the more complex the stimuli, the further along that pathway that it was? The next form is prosopagnosia, um, which is about faces. Um, so the ability that 
that these individuals will lose the ability to recognize faces. Um, and again, it's going to have kind of um, some sort of damage in that face selective um, region. This is also has an element of heritability um, so that it can be passed down as well. Um, and this would indicate that something um, didn't, is, is being operated differently in those individuals' brains where they're not able to recognize faces. <clears throat> the next one we're going to talk about is topographic agnosia. And this affects the ability to recognize buildings and spatial locations, streets, and others. Um, and this is, they th is thought to be related to the parahippocampal place area. So again, um, different areas of the brain, um, res damages to different areas of the brain result in different deficits. And again, this is going to support that modular coding view. Okay, so thus far we really talked a lot about bottom-up processing of visual objects. Um, we did this in chapters 2 and 3 in terms of the sensation, the brain pathways, the modules. Um, so kind of, you know, again, going from the light itself um, all the way through the brain. That's going to be bottom up where we're going from sensation up to the brain. We've also done that today um, and talking about chapter four, um, looking at the organization and the figure to ground and the grouping and the recognition. But it's important to remember that the context influences perception as well. Okay, so that it's not just all this bottom up that we've talked about. Um, there is the role of top down processing um, where our expectations, our previous knowledge, um, what we understand, um, what we know affects our perception. So an example of that is this. It says, I think it says the cat. Um, but what's interesting is if you look at the H and the A, they are the exact same image, but we interpret them differently depending on their context. So because these are words that are pretty easy to read, um, even my, my first grader, and even when she was in kindergarten, could have done these, um, but we're going to interpret those, those shapes differently. Um, we're going to interpret those objects differently because of our top-down processing. Um, so our knowledge of these words, these sight words, the versus cat, um, in, makes us interpret that shape differently in each word. Um, and, and the more I look at this, it's funny, because when I look at that A, it just really looks like that top was cut off. Where I look at the H, in air quotes, for both of those, and it really just looks like the A, they're kind of just pushed more together. It looks more like an H, even though I know that they're, they're exactly the same. Um, this is, again, that issue of top-down processing. Um, our expectations, our previous knowledge, our previous experiences influencing our interpretation of the information that we're getting from bottom-up. So bottom-up, those two shapes are coming in the exact same way. Um, what's changing is that top-down processing that's saying, hey, wait, wait a second, we know something else is going on here. We've got some information that's going to be helpful to figuring out what these things are because we've experienced these stimuli before. So again, top-down processing is the opposite as it sounds, and bottom-up processing. Um, top-down processing is going to really emphasize those goals, attention, our knowledge, and our expectations. Um, so, you know, when, we're, when we see letters, we expect to read. So that's an expectation. That's top-down processing. Our knowledge of the word the and the word cat, um, about w how words go together, how we have to have a vowel. Um, you know, C-H-T doesn't really, it's not a word. C-A-T is a word. Um, and that knowledge makes a difference. Um, and goals. Again, we are, have gotten so good at reading that we kind of automatically do it without trying to read things um, because that goal has become so innate and implicit now. Um, Top-down information is really combined with bottom-up information in the ventral pathway, and it really speeds up the process of recognizing these objects in a scene. So the bottom-up information is coming in, the top-down information combines with it to say, hey, we can help, we can speed this process up, we can make this more effective based on um, our previous expectations, based on our knowledge. Now, top-down processing can get in the way too. Um, on the last slide, it was helpful. 
knowing how to read and having experienced those words before was helpful in trying to interpret what those things were and these ambiguous kind of stimuli. Um, but it can also get in the way as well. The brain is always actively predicting um, our future and what we're going to see in terms of our perceptual future. Um, and this, it takes both the things that just happened um, and kind of the things that have happened before. We also, it also takes into account something that we're going to call unconscious inference. And it's important to point out that these theories of top-down information really are more conceptually driven. Um, so we know that something else is going on besides bottom-up processing, but it's really hard to, pull, to tease apart to be able to study empirically. Well, the bottom-up stuff's really very easy where we are with our current scientific knowledge. And so that's why we have so much more information about the bottom-up, um, because we can really talk about those and, and organize those with hard and fast data. Um, whereas, again, the theories of top-down um, are going to be a lot harder to do. But let's try it. Let's try it anyways. Okay, so the visual system and this idea of this unconscious inference um, is the idea that we're kind of taking um, statistics of our environment into account. Um, that our brain is unconsciously combining two probabilities to infer, so this is where that inference is coming in, what type of scene is produced um, the current retinal image that we're getting. So what really is going on here, okay? So we're getting a re retinal image, but because of all the things like object clutter and object and variety and all those different things, it's in variable views, it's hard to always know exactly what you're looking at. Um, and so the idea is unconsciously that it's combining these two probabilities. The first of which is the probability of all possible scenes. So every possibility that's out there, okay? Um, and examples um, and B or C, B and C of this image um, are two of the possibilities for A, okay? There's more possibilities for A, but those are two of the possibilities for what's going on underneath that fallen log, okay? So we have that neither of the ropes are connected, no, that the right rope is not connected, we have that the left rope is not connected, or we have that both of them are connected. That one's not pictured. There's a number of different possibilities. Um, or neither of them are connected. There's a number of different possibilities for what's going on underneath this log. And the other thing that it, our brain is unconsciously combining, and again, this is conceptually driven, um, is the idea that for each possible scene, um, what's the probability that that's what produced this re retinal image? So it's saying, okay, here are all my options. What's the probability? What's the most likely? Remember, the brain always wants to go back to the simplest answer. Um, and so that's what it's going to try and do. Um, conceptually, this is how this theory works, is that it's going to go to the one that has the highest probability of happening. Um, and again, a lot of, um, you know, mathematics and statistics are playing in here. And there is a lot of evidence that the brain does use information, perceptual information statistically. Um, there's lots of evidence from speech learning. Um, there's lots of evidence. Um, from all kinds of different things um, where it looks at the statistical probabilities of how things connect and what they've seen thus far. Um, and so this is that idea is that we're doing it visually as well. Um, this idea of, you know, statistics playing a role in, in making judgments. Um, but again, what's important to note is that we're not doing this consciously. This is not something that we're saying, okay, well, the probability of this is that, and combine that, no. Obviously, this is all happening on an unconscious level, if in fact it's happening, as the theory suggests. And again, there is support for this, um, given um, the range of support we see for statistics um, in our perceptual abilities, which we'll continue to talk about throughout the semester. Um, and so again, the idea of these two, um, you know, B is more probable, um, than A because the ropes um, are more lined up, right? Um, so it's more probable that B is happening in this situation than, um, than C is happening just because of the image itself. Um, so again, this is the idea that we're, we're combining this information um, in our representations. Okay, this ends our conversation about chapter four, recognizing visual objects. Thanks.